Welcome everyone to the 28th edition of Bogleheads on Investing. Today our special guest is Roger Lowenstein. Roger is a former Wall Street Journal Heard on the Street columnist and the author of six best-selling books about the financial industry. Hi everyone, my name is Rick Ferry and I'm the host of Bogleheads on Investing. This podcast, as with all podcasts, are brought to you by the John C. Bogle Center for Financial Literacy, a 501c3 nonprofit organization. Donations can be made at BogleCenter.net. I am pleased to bring you today Roger Lowenstein. Roger was a longtime reporter for the Wall Street Journal. His work also appeared in Bloomberg, Fortune, New York Times magazines, and other publications. But most noteworthy are his six award-winning books about Wall Street. We'll be talking about each one of those books today. So with no further ado, let me introduce Roger Lowenstein. Welcome, Roger. Rick, it's a pleasure to be on the show. Well, thank you so much for being our guest on Bogleheads on Investing. I've been a big fan of yours since... so. back in the mid-90s and actually met you one time. I know you're not going to remember, but we were at a Charter Financial Analyst meeting in Detroit. You were promoting your Buffett book, and I got to sit next to you. I I got there really early to make sure I got the seat next to you because I wanted to, <laughs> I wanted to meet you. I thought that was a, just a fantastic book. And we'll get to uh, all of your books in a minute. Uh, but before we get there, could you tell us a little bit of how you end up being Roger Lowenstein, the author? Sure. I was... A journalist in college at Cornell, uh, got very into uh, journalism then, always was a big reader and had in mind being a writer would be a cool thing, but you know, no idea of financial journalism or financial writing. When I should say when I went to uh, college, which was back in the mid-70s, uh, there was very little interest uh, on campus or anywhere as far as I could tell in uh, Wall Street. There was so much political focus uh, due to... Uh, Uh, the Civil Rights Movement, and the Vietnam War, and then Watergate. And uh, Wall Street was just something that all guys in gray suits did, and and, uh, we didn't pay much attention to. But I got uh, a series of jobs uh, with small papers, and just because I wanted to break out into something more interesting, I went down to South America, and I was working for a paper, uh, a terrific paper, in Caracas, Venezuela, which uh, unfortunately the, uh, the current government finally shut down. Down in, uh, in Venezuela, I, to supplement my income, I started stringing for the Wall Street Journal. You may have at least heard of them. Mm, yeah. Uh, because <laughs> Venezuela had a lot of oil production and was interesting to, uh, to Wall Street and to its readers. And I discovered there that, you know, I started doing all this budget stories and that, that economic stories could be fun. And, and through the medium of the journal, uh, I realized that there was you know, a real interest in, and you could get to a lot of facts and also a lot of interesting stories through economic journalism. And after about two years, uh, I was ready to come home, and they offered me a job. By the time I got there, this was uh, very end of the 70s, late 79, and the big story then were mergers and acquisitions. Mm-hmm. It was just uh, CEOs were waking up in the in the morning, uh, looking at proxy t- contests and discovering that they didn't run their companies anymore. It was exciting stuff. And then I just I just got uh, hooked uh, writing about business and investing in economics. And uh, it sort of took off from there, I guess. And then you went on to uh, write uh, six books so far, and uh, understand you're working on another one. That's uh, right. You know, I, I always had this desire to to write uh, more long form. I did some magazine work, but my family, I don't mind saying, had an investment in Berkshire Hathaway, and I got interested via that in Warren Buffett and thought he would be. Uh, a good subject for a book. He wasn't so well known back then. And and that was the first book. That's how I got into writing books. And I'm going to get to that Buffett book in a minute. Actually, um, the first book that I really want to talk about is your latest book, which is America's Bank, The Epic Struggle to Create the Federal Reserve. And this this book was a a financial history book. And what made you uh, interested in going back and looking at the struggle to create a central bank? Well, two things, and, and I appreciate you bringing up that one first because it's really a favorite, a personal favorite. You know, I've written a lot uh, of contemporary uh, histories of basically bad financial news because when the Fed gets involved, you know, usually it's, the Fed's like an umpire. You know, only notice them when something goes wrong. 
So I was very interested in, in the role of the Fed, and I felt that readers were uh, interested in the role of the Fed. The, the history of the Fed was just uh, remarkable to me because we had been so late in ever having one. I mean, way after European nations, the Russians, the Japanese, everybody, uh, the entire developed world uh, realized that you had a stronger financial system if you had a lender of last resort, somebody to lend when nobody else was lending. But we didn't have one. And the, the reasons we didn't have one uh, go back to George Washington, but they, they're really very current. If you look at the American uh, reluctance, say what you will, good or bad, about Obamacare, any health care plan, uh, every other country in the, around the world has figured out that it makes sense to have a system, not the United States. It's having something centralized that touches a lot of raw nerves in this country. It, it has ever since 1776. After all, that was our history of uh, uh, rebelling against the central government. And the story of how the Fed was created, really the story of one banker who came here from uh, overseas, from Europe, and couldn't believe that uh, an otherwise developed and advanced, financially advanced country uh, was still living uh, sort of in the 18th century. And so I, I just thought there was a very good story to tell and, and a very relevant story to today. Yeah, I didn't realize how late the U.S. was to central banking. I mean, of course, we in this country think that our central bank is big and powerful and so forth, and we probably created the whole concept, but in fact, we didn't. So no, we, 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 we didn't. Our central bank lived on Madison Avenue. It was a guy named J.P. Morgan. I mean, I say that uh, tongue-in-cheek, but, but uh, not completely, because when you know, we would have a periodic uh, market crashes, and the government would go to him hat in hand, to get up a syndicate and uh, rescue the government. And yeah, this was fine in an era when the government was small and the economy was small. And finally, there did some stirrings before this that we really needed to uh, modernize the system. We were losing, uh, we want uh, the creditor behind all sorts of trade agreements. London had all that business because it didn't have a lender last resort. So there were other reasons. Uh, but in 1907, there was a market crash it came from the what we call the shadow banking system. That always seems to come from the you know the edges and and creep into the into the heart. And at that point, they went to Morgan, and Morgan couldn't do it this time. It, it was it was too big uh, for one man. There were uh, panics in banks across this New York City and then across the country, and there was increasing realization then that we needed a system, not just you know we were too big for. Uh, Big Daddy uh, Warbucks uh, to save us. And, uh, there was a, a commission of a congressmen and others who went over to Europe and studied central banks. And, by the way, it was still such a, a bogeyman that when um, the lead senator involved and a few bankers decided to uh, map out how this should happen, they went in secret uh, to an island off the coast of Georgia and wrote the original blueprint for what became the Federal Reserve, telling nobody because they if the word got out that people were planning a central bank, it'd be dead in the water. It was, it was hot stuff. Oh, that was Jekyll Island. That was Jekyll Island, yes. It was Jekyll and, Island. And now let me ask a question. And In your view, and this is your opinion, has the changes that the Federal Reserve Bank been going through under first Ben Bernanke after the financial crisis and now Jerome Powell with buying assets that are traditionally not treasury bonds in order to help uh, monetary policy. I mean, th these are big changes. Well, yeah, the specifics are different. Uh, our financial system is way more complicated. Uh, the sorts of instruments that are out there are more numerous and more complicated. So that if you want the uh, Federal Reserve, the central bank to be relevant, it's going to have to act in different ways and through different instruments. But if you look at the history of the debate around the creation of the Federal Reserve, they had these same debates, but they were just about, there was all this talk then about what sort of debt instruments would the Federal Reserve purchase, which was another way of saying, what will be money? Because anything that the Fed would buy would be money. And uh, mm -hmm. farmers from, uh, from the Midwest and bankers from the Midwest said they should buy a, a warehouse receipts. Corn should be money. Um, and you can imagine why the farmers in the Midwest would say that. That uh -huh. didn't make it into the bill. So the, the, the fight over, or, or the argument over, what financial instruments uh, should be backed by the Fed is age old. And the basic purpose, although 
instrumentalities of change, it's more complicated, it's obviously far bigger, have changed. The idea that the Fed should rush in when there's a real systemic crisis, that hasn't changed. And, and that's what we saw in uh, 2008 and 2009. And we're seeing it again, of course, now in the economic crisis uh, caused by the pandemic. Uh, so in that very basic sense, I, I think the Fed is still doing the job that Paul Warburg, the founder of I was alluding to before, Nelson Aldrich and Carter Glass, some of the other founders, uh, had in mind. Oh, great. Thank you for that. Uh, let's go back to the beginning, the first book that you wrote, Buffett, The Making of an American Capitalist. You did such a fine job with this book. Now, I've read all the Buffett books before and after, and I've always come back to this as the best Buffett book, in my view. Well, thank you. Tell me, in investigating this book, what did you learn that struck you as being something very different and unique about Warren Buffett? Well, um, one thing I learned in this debate was um, how tough he is. You know, he's a, he's a nice guy. He's a sort of folksy guy. He's got that, you know, chuckling sense of humor. And that, all that's true. That's not uh, invented or anything. He's extremely tough. When I say tough, if you ask him for something once, believe me, don't, don't, don't waste time going back and asking him three weeks later. He's enormously efficient. And one of the ways in which he's efficient is he doesn't waste a lot of time rethinking decisions. He's sort of cold-blooded about what makes sense. I remember there was a, a friend of his in Omaha, and uh, he, was, he was putting together some uh, idea for a new company. He was trying to get investment for And actually, he went to the, the richest guy in town. This is years before uh, the country knew about Buffett, but everybody in Omaha knew he was the big financial wheel. And um, he, uh, he said, we, we, you know, do you think enough of this idea uh, to invest in it? And Buffett said no. And he said, well, do you think enough of me to invest in it? And Buffett said, no. Hmm. Just like that. <laughs> and you know, this, this gentleman said, it was, it was so refreshing. There's nothing like the word no. Instead of a belabored <laughs> uh, exclama- explanation and excuse, and uh, maybe I'll think about it. it. It freed this gentleman from having to wonder and come back, and it freed Buffett to go on to the next thing. He, he does that uh, all the time with investments that, um, and, and this is a, a real lesson. Uh, some people, if they're presented with an investment idea, maybe their broker says, and they're sort of wondering about it, they're not convinced. So they'll just go in a little bit. Buffett doesn't go in a little bit. If he doesn't like something, he moves on. But he's just very good at saying no. He does that with philanthropies too. If it's, if it's not his thing, he, he doesn't give a little bit just because you know, he wants to make the person feel good, even if the person is a friend. And that's, that's caused some hard feelings at times over the years, but he's very tough. He sort of follows his inner compass and, uh, and is also very honest in, uh, in a fundamental way. And uh, I was struck by that. I was also struck by just how terribly quick he is to just spending time with him. He's so smart. And I went to all the annual meetings that he held while I was in the three or four years that I was doing the book. And in these days, it was still held in the Jaws Museum in uh, in Omaha. They'd moved out of out of the hotel down on the Dodge Street, but but they were up kind of mid what was then Midtown. And a few uh, people there in the Q and A, somebody says, uh, "Mr. Buffett, how good is your health? Uh, I can't afford an event risk." And Buffett immediately spits back, "Neither can I." You know? <laughs> <laughs> he, he he really is quick. Uh, I know from firsthand, he sees journalists coming around the corner uh, uh, or people trying to raise money. And he, he, you might as well just hit him straight because he, if you have some ulterior motive, or you're going to warm up to your question or your request. He's going to see it coming around the corner. When I did the book, I, um, uh, the first thing I did when I got a contract was I wrote him telling him I was going to do it. Uh, there were all these situations I wanted to interview him in, in his office, in his home, when he was on the road all that kind of stuff. And he just wrote back and said, no, I'm not interested. I mean, that was, uh, that was pretty hard. And, and, and he said something interesting. He, he said, it'll be better for me. He didn't want to be uh, crowded uh, by me. Uh, he said, it'd be better for you as well. And I, at, at first I thought he was just saying that to let me down easy. As I did it, that not having him in the room forced me to come to my own conclusions about Warren Buffett uh, there's plenty of material out there. There's no shortage. Yeah, you read the book. You know, there's no shortage of information about him. Uh, 
and uh, this could be my book. Interesting about Buffett. Uh, a lot of people perhaps don't know this. At first, it was a call it a hedge fund or a private equity fund, and he uh, was- a hedge fund. It was a private partnership, and since it wasn't buying uh, mainly private, they had one whole company, but they weren't buying companies and taking them private. Uh, so it, it 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 was it was pretty close to the hedge fund model of today. And and he made his money by instead of taking a big salary, taking money out of the fund, he took his cut, which if I recall, it was like 20% of anything over a certain return. It might have been, it wasn't the return of the market, but it was over a certain return. It was was over 6%. There we go, over um, 6%. And and I believe, uh, whilst I've written the book, I believe it was a quarter of the profits, but over 6%, he had no fee. So it was, in a sense, a more self-confident uh, framework than the most virtually every hedge fund I know set up today because today they take uh, a cut of the profits, but they also take a fee, a percent of the assets. So if they're not making it one way, they're making it another way. Buffett took no fee. So if he didn't beat 6%, which was that back then an assumed treasury rate, a risk-free rate. Yeah. So he, he wasn't going to earn any money just for getting you the treasury rate. You could do that on your own. You didn't need him for that. But once he started, for the profits he made above 6%, uh, I believe it was a quarter, uh, he, he took a quarter of it. And, and, and that's a generous, you know, that, that, that's, a, that's a big cut. Yeah, but, it, uh, it is how he... It only, it, only, it, it only paid, I mean, his, his money really was uh, where his uh, mouth was. He wrote these beautiful uh, partnership letters, which were uh, proxies for the uh, annual letters that you right. know, Buffett shareholders know today, but, but he just went to the small circle of people who owned his partnership. And he kept saying in these letters, you know, someday I'm going to lose money and we're not going to yeah. do this forever. He beat the Dow <laughs> every year. He never lost money. And um, he just didn't have a bad game. It was, it was, it was bizarre how good he was. But this is how he made his money. He made his money by taking his fee, but leaving it in the partnership. And this is how he became wealthy. This was the origin of his wealth. One of the stocks that they bought in the early 60s was a, a textile maker, a broadcloth and things like that in New Bedford, Massachusetts, called Berkshire Hathaway. And he sort of got into a, a rocket for the guy who ran it. By then, he was sort of he was the biggest outside shareholder. He didn't like the management. He didn't want to sell it. And so the, uh, the partnership bought a controlling stake, and um, Bob became the controlling investor. And when he liquidated the partnership, at the end of 1968, he just said, this is a bad market, I can't find anything. And he returned all the money to the shareholders, completely, completely called the top of the market, by the way. But there were two stocks that he owned too much of uh, to sell. And so he just said, I'm going to give you your pro rata share. One was a, a retailer name associated, the other one was Berkshire. And he said, you can do what you want. By the way, I'm holding on to my Berkshire. And anybody with... Uh, any brains that knew that was a, a good advice for them too. And then he just sort of sat with the, you know, Berkshire for a few years and, you know, with a textile company and then he bought a steel mill with it and a small newspaper and then he buys an insurance company with it. And now that this the textile company owned an insurance company it had float to invest and he starts buying common stocks and the people who were following Buffett, very few said, I think the guy's going to do it again. <laughs> and, and, and in fact, now under a corporate framework, I think from the partnership framework of, of the, his early years, he was in fact doing it again and obviously did do it again. The stock band was $40, $40, 60 $80 or so in, in those years. Yeah. Uh, so if you'd gotten into it, then um, you'd be clipping a lot of coupons. <laughs> uh, the make, Buffett, the making of an American capitalist. I mean, you really get into the details of this, uh, how Buffett became what it is today, how Berkshire Hathaway became what it is today. It's a really great book. Well, let's get into uh, the next four books. And the next four books kind of follow a patent. And I call them uh, crisis books. Crisis <laughs> books. Yes. You had the, uh, the financial crisis of 1998 that was caused by a hedge fund called Long-Term Capital Management. And this is a great book. Any finance uh, student needs to read when genius failed, the rise and fall of long-term capital management. Okay, it was just a real uh, lesson to me on, on what goes on inside of hedge funds. 
Well, you know, I just want to say first that when you mentioned those four books, and they were all about a financial crisis, at each juncture where I wrote each of them, I thought, uh, well, I'm really lucky because I get to write about the one and the biggest financial crisis of our generation that we'll ever see. And then like two and a half, three years later, there'd be a bigger <laughs> one. It just, uh, the lesson was, uh, the lesson doesn't get learned. Uh, John Kenneth Galbraith said, uh, you know, they, they don't ask uh, military historians, uh, what do we do to prevent another Waterloo? People sort of figure, well, uh, they won't be dumb enough to invade Russia again. But it, that's not true in economics. Everybody In finance, everybody wants to know, how can we avoid um, the next financial disaster because they keep happening. I still think long-term capital, that story, the when genius failed story, was sort of the, the model uh, for what happened. Very smart guys, because uh, yeah. nobody would lend money to people who weren't who were that much money, who weren't very smart. Took a whole lot of risk, and you'd have to have you'd have to be smart enough to be to think you were that good to take that much risk. You could say it was a little arrogant. They thought that they were hedged. Guess what? Hedges they work great in good times and bad times. I think there's a line in the book that the correlations go to one, which means everything starts to go bad at once. Yeah. Uh, nobody wants to take any sort of risk. And no matter where you had risk, uh, it was going bad against them. And, and so that it just, it sort of plays out and you see these people who were truly the best and brightest and richest of the financial world, watching them probably day after day as uh, the gods of, of finance uh, turn against them. The light motif of the book is another lesson that uh, hasn't been learned and won't be learned, I'm, I'm convinced. They were all uh, disciples in two cases, they were Nobel Prize winners for having written um, some of the textbooks of modern financial theory. Uh, the idea that you could program all this and feed into a, a computer with big enough brains, a history of price movements, and know exactly what you were going to come up against in the future. And you know, that works until it stops working. The, the um, history books don't uh, tell us what's going to happen in the future. They don't even tell us what could happen in the future. Uh, Lord knows we've seen that uh, now. Uh, I listened to a, a radio show yesterday about a, a small business that had all kinds of insurance, insurance against floods, against earthquakes. They didn't have insurance against a pandemic, however. And yeah. there are just things you can't anticipate. You know, markets, they just don't always act the way they did uh, in, the, in the past. So had we tried to model for an, uh, an event like the Great Depression, in the year 2005, we would have said it happens once a century. After 2008, we would have had it up to twice a century. Now it's three times. <laughs> to think that uh, somehow the computers are any smarter than the data that's been fed into it, and the historical data can guarantee you the future, is really a fool's comfort. That was really the leitmotif of the book. What was interesting was who are the investors in long-term capital management, and initially. Uh, Merriweather went out and they got outside investors. But after a while, and to the benefit of the outside investors, the, they all got kicked out. And it, I yeah, not all. But the partners in the fund realized they thought they had too much capital. The reason they felt they had uh, too much capital was uh, over the first few years, markets had moved in their direction. So the type of trade they did, there wasn't as much room to go in the future. And they tried to make up for this by adding leverage. In other words, if you can't make as much money, uh, you can still make the same amount of money if you're more leveraged, which is a really nutty way. You, know, you have to take what the market gives you and not be greedy. And, but they decided to leverage up, and the, you know, the, the way you leverage up is to have less capital for each dollar you're investing. So they returned capital uh, to their uh, outside investors, you know, much to the joy of these outside investors. <laughs> The, I, I want to spend a moment, though. You, you mentioned who their investors were. Merrill Lynch, uh, you know, UBS of Switzerland, all the big names in finance. You know, there's this myth that the, the inside guy, the pro, knows better. The pro doesn't know better. The, the average investor out there, uh, I mean your uncle, your sister-in-law, whoever it is, knows better because what they're trying to do is they're looking for stocks they understand, they're probably buying Apple. They're following the Peter Lynch dictum. I don't mean the day traders, but the ones who are buying things for you know, long term. They're, they're, they're doing things they understand. Not with the pros who bought LTCM. It was a black box. They didn't understand it. They weren't even allowed to see it. 
they were mesmerized by this image of you know omnipotence, and uh, they got suckered. Not not suckered willfully. There was nothing nothing untoward about it. But they got duped into taking the same kind of risk that the partners themselves took. And going on to the next crisis book, you talk about the origins of the crash, the great bubble and its undoing. And here we're talking about the tech boom, uh, the internet boom, dot com bubble that occurred yeah. in the 1990s, and then it blew up. It really, um, a personal favorite. I'm glad you brought it up. This is really a book about the character of Wall Street and um, the role of uh, executive compensation in how uh, companies were run and misrun. Companies like uh, the late, great MCI, the late, great uh, Enron, and so on. Also, the character of speculation, but now speculation on a much more mom and pop level. Because you remember those dot-com stocks. Uh, those were stocks that your uncle and sister-in-law were buying. The uh, web van, if you remember that name, and you know, pets.com and all those stocks that many, many of them uh, went under. And this was a just a, a bizarre era in which uh, companies weren't even showing profits or the forecast of profits, and uh, people couldn't get uh, enough of them. That, was, uh, that era sort of merged into this era. The stock profits were so great that conventional companies felt the need to get their stocks up and they began to uh, play with their numbers. As, or or change uh, their name to dot .com. Or, yeah, I mean, Enron did that. Enron became, was a, it was an oil an energy services company that became a new age company. Uh, MCI did that. Lucent, Xerox, Waste Management, all these companies uh, played terrible games with their uh, numbers. Some of them failed, some of them didn't. Uh, but their stocks all plunged. Uh, it was all about enriching the executives in the short term by uh, juicing the stock, uh, no matter um, the long term. And it was really a, um, a come to Jesus moment for, for Wall Street. And people don't remember the, the stock market uh, fell in half, in which, which is a, you know, quite a serious downturn. President Bush, who was, who, who was no big, big regulator, said this has got to stop. Business pages shouldn't look like a scandal sheet. I, I think those hmm. were his uh, exact uh, words. I recall... Wall Street analysts who were highly compensated in many ways by this whole era where, you know. Yes, it was all crazy chain where the analysts, of course, were touting the stocks that their um, investment bankers uh, yeah. uh, were selling. And, um, you know, Mary Meeker was asked, or Morgan Stanley, what's her, what was her justification for a very high priced stock? And she said, bull market. Well, that's not analysis, that's cheerleading. Hmm. Uh, and that was, you know, she was uh, you know, anything but uh, but alone. And and then, then privately, there were some emails where these analysts between each other would say, I wouldn't touch this with a 10-foot pole, and they put a buy on it because they were looking for investment that's, banking business. That's right. I mean, it was, you know, interest rates, uh, once again, were very low, and uh, people were, they were willing to take more risk because of that. And they thought they discovered, uh, you know, Galconda, the expression you used in about the 1920s, the new era, uh, this wonderland where companies could uh, sell stock forever without any profits, which, which you think about, was really just a Ponzi scheme because the only source of paying off the first round of, uh, of investors would be uh, investments from the next round and the next round of investors. Uh, sooner or later, you got to have profits or your company's not going to survive. It was the new paradigm. <laughs> the next one is I'm, I'm actually going to skip a book here and I'll get back to it because I want it to be my last book. So I'm skipping one and going to your fourth crisis book. And that was the, the end of Wall Street. And here now we're talking about the mortgage crisis and what created it. You know, that course broke in uh, 2008, the origins of it were uh, people like you know, Mozilla at uh, Countrywide and uh, Washington Mutual out in Seattle who were seeding the entire country with mortgages, first 95% of the equity, 98% of the equity, 100% of the equity. You know, just, it's, of course, it's, it's not a loan when you give uh, uh, someone 100% of the equity. It's, it's, it's a gift. Then they were giving 100% loans at 
at steeply increasing prices. So you had millions of homeowners who had zero equity in their homes and who owed an amount of money that couldn't withstand even the, even a minuscule depreciation in price. This was being blessed by the credit rating agencies. It was being blessed by the Wall Street banks who were selling the mortgage securities. But it really was a, a larger version, uh, and for that reason, a more serious version, of, uh, of the first one in this series we talked about, of uh, when genius failed, of, of the LTCM. You know, it was just giant risk-taking on a much more serious scale because this time the, the people affected were um, you know, a sizable percentage of the homeowners mm-hmm. of America. And homes are something, if, if Wall Street fat cats want to go out and, and play with their assets or their, even their firms, that's one thing. But when you um, destabilize Americans' homes, which are for most Americans, are the great bulk of the equity they have, you really get a serious problem. And you remember that we went into, you know, this terrible, terrible recession, unprecedented since, since the Great Depression, when the mortgages collapsed and nobody was prepared for it. Not the Treasury, Bernanke at the Fed said that the subprime mortgages won't, won't be a blip. Not only did he say it wouldn't affect uh, the entire economy, he said it wouldn't even affect the entire mortgage industry. It would just, it'd just be, you know, a modest rise in, in subprime default. And, uh, all these experts were dead wrong. In fact, if they were playing a different version of a daisy chain game because uh, anytime uh, someone needed uh, refinancing, uh, someone's mortgage was up, they just refinanced. That game of papering over uh, you know, bad loans or more loans can only go on for so long. And eventually in 2006, prices began to peak. And once prices peaked, the game was over uh, because the whole thing was presaged on you know, ever-rising uh, housing prices. And that was a, it was a scary time. It, it was thrilling to write about, but it was a, a really a frightening time. I, I remember that Sunday night when Lehman went down, and mm-hmm. you know, nobody really knew you know, whether the sun was going to rise, at least in a financial sense, on uh, Monday morning. Yeah. One of the scariest comments made during that period of time was when Alan Greenspan said, you know, in retrospect, we really didn't understand you know, how the financial system worked or something to that effect. What he said was, uh, and, and this comes up in um, one of the early books we talked about, Origins of the Crash, when the lack of regulation of uh, financial instruments was a big issue. And Greenspan's view, because he was a, a, a big free marketer, and look, I'm a free marketer, but I believe in, in the highway, but we got to have speed limits. Uh, and, and you have to have speed limits in financial markets. Greenspan had said that basically any deal that private bankers make with each other since each banker is acting in their own self-interest uh, it's, it's got to be rational and basically doesn't need to be regulated, which was said in uh, such complete ignorance of what history had shown as if there hadn't been a uh, banking crisis uh, ad infinitum in the past. And it was also, uh, it also overlooked a fact of how banks are run. If you're uh, on the mortgage desk at Lehman and uh, you package a lot of securities, you get paid for it. If they all go uh, bust two years later, uh, you don't have to give the money back. In fact, you probably moved on to Bear Stearns and Merrill Lynch by then. It's somebody else's problem. So the people uh, making those deals didn't, in many cases, even have an incentive not to make bad deals. They had every incentive to make every deal they could, good or bad. And um, Greenspan, uh, the comment you're referring to, was he, he said, I can't remember the exact word that's in the book, but you know, we who had faith in, in the markets to operate, uh, you know, he, he, he fessed up. Yeah, yeah, it was a little scary to me to hear him say something like that. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. He, was naive. he was naive, maybe willfully naive. But by the time he, he fessed up, he was out. Uh, yes, but, that's um, correct. He had been a disciple of Ayn Rand and uh, you know, ultra-free marketers. And Bernanke at that moment, and this figures in uh, The End of Wall Street, Fortunately for us, although we hadn't seen it coming, he didn't know what to do because he started the Great Depression and he knew that you had to um, to be that lender last resort a la uh, America's Bank, the Federal Reserve. And he turned the Fed into the greatest uh, rescue operation in in its 100-year history. I find it interesting how Treasury stepped up uh, during this crisis, uh, first with Timothy Geithner and then uh, Hank Paulson to work with the Fed to kind of save the day in many ways. 
Well, uh, Hank Paulson, of course, was Bush's um, Secretary of the Treasury. I interviewed him a couple of times for the book. He and um, Bernanke made a very interesting team because uh, Bernanke was a Republican and uh, Paulson was really a rib rock a Republican. Uh, neither he nor Bush came into office with any thought of socializing the banking system. And yet, when they proposed the TARP, in a partial sense, that's exactly what they did. You know, they had the Congress uh, purchase equity shares of the federal government in uh, J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, and, you know, right on down the list of, of all, all the biggest banks and, and, and virtually all the banks, you know, some, some small share uh, to stabilize the banking system in, in the case of the, the banks that were teetering to save the banks. You know, that was, I think, kind of uh, heroic on the part of Bernanke and Paulson and, frankly, uh, W., who, um, you know, had no notion of one to do that kind of stuff. But when they came to him and said, you got to do it, he did. Yeah. The Republican Congress was not so eager. When, when, when the TARP was crafted and came to a vote, the House voted down and the market fell 700 points that day. Uh, Representative Kyle later said, he said, my constituents were divided. Half of them said no, and the other half said hell no. But hmm. they thought that the Wall Street crisis would just sort of affect Wall Street. The Main Street would just sally on un- un- unaffected. And when the market uh, then started to crash day after day, the House was called back and in a hurry uh, approved the TARP. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Very interesting uh, point in history. Uh, let me uh, circle back to the third crisis book, which is now, in my opinion, still on the table. And that is While America Aged, How Pension Debts Ruined General Motors, Stopped the New York City Subways, Bankrupt San Diego, and Looms as the Next Financial Crisis. To me, this is still on the table. Yeah, thank you. Yeah, that was uh, different in this sense from the others. The pension crisis is a slow-burning uh, crisis. You know, these other ones all had, you know, big crescendo-like moments. LTCM when it when it took a bailout from uh, the banks on Wall Street, the mortgage crash when when Lehman went under, and so on. This one book was published in 2008. I started working on it in 2006, and we're still talking about it as current in in the end of the year uh, 2020. And the reason that's so is because, of course, the pension system isn't one system. It's particularly the public pension system is thousands of individual systems, uh, teacher systems, state systems, municipal worker systems across the country. They've each hit against hard times uh, at different times. But since that book has come out, Puerto Rico, Stockton, California, Detroit, small and large cities across the country have failed. Some of them literally in bankruptcy and some of them effectively like uh, Puerto Rico, Chicago. Now there's no way to see how they get out of their pension mess. Uh, same thing with New Jersey. And that's as much a, a political book as, as a financial book, because the, there's nothing wrong with the pension system in theory. You know, collective insurance is a very good idea. If a group of people insure themselves, the odds are it's going to be a sounder system than if, if you know, one person saves for their own retirement the problem is that when you get a political actors approving benefits, and these are benefits that stretch out 20 and 30 years in the future, that political actor has an interest, of course, in awarding generous benefits because by the time the benefits come due, uh, they'll have retired. Certainly moved on to another job and in most cases retired. And so there's just a natural moral hazard. And they keep voting these benefits in and not approving um you know, adequate funding. And the, the book was not an attack on pension funding or benefits. It was just a cry, please fund whatever level you decide. And that's a negotiated question between unions and, and the government. Whatever level you decide, you got to fund it. But you can't approve benefits without funding them. And I'm afraid, you know, as with the others, that's a lesson that uh, we're still, still learning the hard way. And uh, given what um, the pandemic has done to municipal finance, Uh, you know, there's there's going to be a lot more of that to come. And one of the big problems that I see as a financial advisor is is that these areas of the country that you mentioned that have big pension holes, they're losing business. I mean, people are leaving because they keep having to increase their state income tax. And now you see an exodus 
of uh, wealthy individuals, of retirees, of businesses from those areas of the country that have these huge pension liabilities to other parts of the country where there's the there's not as high or an onerous of a, a tax rate on either the corporation or the individuals. And that makes it even harder for the people who stay back. Sooner or later, taxpayers also will, will vote uh, with their feet. In a sense, and this may sound circuitous, but we learned uh, a lesson the teachers' unions, the sanitation work, workers' unions, and so on and so on, and jurisdiction after jurisdiction, they represent a narrow interest. And those interests aren't society's interests. Society has a much greater interest. You know, our cities and states have to be run, and compensation has to be meted out, including pensions, with that larger interest in mind, uh, not just with satisfying the narrow po- parochial interests of public sector unions. Roger, I just want to get your parting views of how do you think America sits today in the world? You know, I think we've been through a very rough time, but I think uh, we're starting to see um, silver linings. You know, there were people saying, that, and I, I, I really didn't believe this because I think it's never as dark as it looks at the darkest hour, but you know, Wall Street would never come back and the economy would never come back. And, and you know, we've now lived through the uh, pandemic for six, seven months. The economy's lived through it for six, seven months. The pandemic's still with us, but, but uh, mortality rates are, are dropping from it. Uh, the economy has been, I think you'd have to say, remarkably resilient you know, in the face of everything it's uh, uh, been through. I think the uh, I'm hopeful that the spirit of the country is becoming less rancorous and, and uh, maybe a little more united. Look, 2020 was a tough year, but you know, if I had to bet uh, 2021, 2022, and so on, uh, things will start to look better. We've been through uh, periods like the Great Depression, and then we'll get through this one. You're working on another book, and I know that you can't disclose what it's about, but I just sort of made a list of three big areas where if I was to make a guess as to what it might be about. Uh, It might be about trade and trade conflicts. Uh, Could be about Medicare uh, and COVID. And the last, it could be about small business and how small business is changing. I know you can't tell me about what the book is about, but... Well, I'll I'll just say um, it's historical, but it has great resonance to today. And um, I'll be out in a year and um, love to talk to you about it in depth when it comes in. <laughs> okay, fair enough. Well, thank you so much for being our guest on Vocal Heads on Investing. We really appreciate the, the time today. Uh, Rick, it was really a pleasure to uh, talk with you. This concludes episode 28 of Vocal Heads on Investing. I'm your host, Rick Ferry. Join us each month to hear a new special guest. In the meantime, Visit Bogleheads.org and the Bogleheads Wiki. Participate in the forum and help others find the forum. Thanks for listening. Music